Good morning, everyone. If you'd like to come and take your seats, we'll begin. We need to begin because we're going to have about an hour-long lecture, then about 20 minutes for Q&A, and then you're all off to, in the rain, <laughs> no, in the cloudy weather, you're off to um, dedicate St. Cyprian's Labyrinth outside, and then lunch back in the refectory. My name is Melody Knowles. I'm the Vice President for Academic Affairs, and it's a pleasure to welcome back alums and to see also our current students and faculty as well as guests here for the second day of this year's Sprig Lectures. The D. Francis Sprig Memorial Lectures was established in 1964, the gift to honor an uncle, the Reverend D. Francis Sprig, VTS class of 1846. And since 1964, we've had a cast of luminaries, everyone from John Hines, Corwright Davis, Juan Williams, Judy Woodruff, Lauren Winner, Dermaid McCulloch, and now this year's speaker. Yesterday, she skillfully exposed what we don't want to see. Integrating social sciences and theology, she showed us ourselves. I don't know about you, but I spent the first half of the lecture um, <laughs> pointing my finger, <laughs> feeling pretty self-righteous about those people who do outgroup homogeneity and the uh, cognitive misers. But with her skill, along with compassion and humor, she eventually helped me see myself. <laughs> I was the one that bought the ticket <laughs> to go meet a friend and then stand with everyone I already knew. Today, all of us, <laughs> you all bought the ticket. I'm glad you're back to do some of this hard work together, a processing with integrity all that science tells us but we're loath to see. So for another morning of deep insight and wisdom, ladies and gentlemen, I, pre I present to you this year's Sprig lecturer, Dr. Christina Cleveland. Thank you, thank you. I'd like to start with a prayer again. This one called A Prayer for Honoring Advocacy. Thank you for this day of progressive perception. Help us to speak out for justice with a special desire fueled by a power greater than surface comforts and outdated systems. Let us be troublemakers to champion those we love and care for, and for those we don't, immediate, we don't intimately know who need our help. Hire us to be powerful voices for the change that heals, reconciles, forgives, and improves. Help us create time and space to lend support where it is needed. Transmit to us the passion to be bothered by violations of another's rights to life, liberty, happiness, and their voice. Find us faithful and in service, riding shotgun to heart-led movements and leading the charge when it is up to us to do so. Remove our feelings of hopelessness and what we perceive to be the opposition. Align us with action and channel our energy for others. Bind us to the medicine of love. Let us affect the transformation that leads to needed change. Light the torch of revolution in our hearts. Stand us upright on a foundation of faith while we take the next steps. Build our voices as instruments for defending freedoms which provide equality. Keep our motivations clean. Grant us the tools to see near and far and find us adjusting the lenses often. Help us to give a leg up to the underdogs, to root for the ones who don't stand a chance. Help us to accept being unliked or misunderstood for positioning ourselves behind what we believe in. Bolster our confidence and give us the understanding and empathy required for sustainable existence. Make tolerance our priority and give us the words and actions to fight violence with the sword of peace. Orient us to inclusivity. Help us to stop putting individuals into dualistic opposition Rather, focus us on repairing broken systems and our participation in them. Dissolve our tendencies for cliques, partisanship, judgment, righteousness, bandwagons, 
and the damning or idolizing of those we perceive to have more than us. Help us to do our parts to clang the bells of freedom. When 10,000 are whispering, make us ones who are listening. Amen. As I mentioned yesterday, I get to do quite a bit of work with organizations and, and with faith-based organizations, and it really is a joy and very um, inter- integral to, the, to my practical theology and my understanding of reconciliation. And a few months ago, I was working um, in person with a national ministry, a well-known one, and all of the senior leaders of this ministry had gathered from all over the country, and we were in one room together. And we were um, talking about what it would look like for them to actually put in practice the principles of justice and reconciliation that we talked about yesterday here in this room. We all want unity. We all want to create spaces that are inclusive, where we can truly honor the image of God in each other, where we can participate in the perichoresis that I talked about yesterday. And this group was no different. They were like, sign us up. Let's do this. And so um, I don't think they knew what they were getting themselves into, but um, their hearts were in the right place. And so we started by looking at some case studies of organizations that have made the power shifts that this organization needs to make. This is a predominantly white organization, even though the constituency that they serve is mostly brown and black. And so we were saying there are going to need to be some really different shifts in the structure of the organization, who's running the organization, um, who's making the decisions, who's running the money, all of these sorts of things. And so let's look at some other organizations that have made these changes. And we turn our eye towards another religious organization that's quite, quite, quite old, not as, um, it's the Community Renewal Society. You may have heard of it. It's part of the UCC tribe. And it's in Chicago. And the Community Renewal Society is a long-standing racial justice organization in Chicago. And their claim to fame is that um, though they're about 135 years old now, they're known for bringing uh, Martin Luther King to Chicago to try to advance the cause of racial justice by integrating neighborhoods. And perhaps less famously or infamously, they're known for being the straw that broke the camel's back for um, MLK because he went to the North thinking white people in the North are not as bad as white people in the South. And then he met Community Renewal Society and was like, wow, this is still horrible up here too. Um, and so this is an interesting organization, right? They, they have a heart for racial justice. Um, it's run by a predominantly white uh, Christian denomination, a mainline denomination, much like the Episcopalians. However, it's unclear that they've been as effective in their work of racial justice as they would like to be. And so what's neat about this organization is um, a friend of mine and someone who I collaborate with quite a bit who's a reconciliation theologian ended up um, becoming the executive director of Community Renewal Society in 2014. And he is a white man who was inheriting a predominantly white organization. And the stated mission of this organization is racial justice in Chicago. And um, in Chicago, whites are about one third of the population. So the vast majority of the issues that this organization intended to address were actually determined by black folks in Chicago. Um, But the board and the staff were white. And so my friend, this executive director said, you know, as a matter of integrity, I cannot, as a white man, report report to a board that is all white if we're supposed to be serving this prominently black um, constituency. And also, if our stated mission is racial justice, then our, our, our interior has to be racially just too. We can't just do racial justice, we have to be racial justice. And so at the time, In 2014, when he inherited this organization, the board was 52% white men and about 70% white. The leadership of the board, the executive committee of the board was 83% white. The staff of the organization, there are about 200 staff, I believe, 52% white. The organizing and the policy divisions, which are the most public-facing divisions of the organization, were majority white. And the leadership staff, the directors, were 67% white. And so as he took on this job, he said, this cannot stay the same. We have to make structural changes. And this has to happen soon. And so 
as he was negotiating the terms of his position, he got buy-in from the board and said, this is the sort of change that if you want me to take this job, I will be leading this change to make our organization more diverse. In three years, by 2017, this past summer, the board, which was 52% white men, was now 64% black and 73% people of color. The leadership of the board, which was 83% white, is now 60% black and 80% people of color. The staff, which was 52% white, is now 69% people of color. The organizing and policy divisions, these forward-facing divisions, are no longer majority white, and in fact now both the development and finance wings of the organization are run by African Americans, which is quite an anomaly in the nonprofit world that black people actually run the money. The leadership staff, which was 67% white, is now 80% black and 100% people of color. Now return to this group of predominantly white male leaders of this Christ national Christian missions organization that I've been working with, and I was sharing these data with them, and I said, let's talk about Community Renewal Society as a model for what your organization can look like and the transformation that can take place in just this one little area, which is staffing and, and board leadership. And I said, does anyone have thoughts or responses or questions? And the first question that one person asked, but everyone seemed to want to know, where did all the white people go? <laughs> but what about us? What's going to happen? We love the idea of racial justice. We certainly want everyone to have a seat at the table. And we want our, our organization to be just. We don't want to just do justice. We want to be just. But wait a second. What does that mean for me? That sounds like I'm going to have to pay something. It sounds like it might impact me. I, like, I love to talk about it. I'll even preach about it. But what about us? Where did all the white people go? We want justice. We want reconciliation. We want unity. But we don't want to pay the price. One of the things that is so compelling to me about the critiques of reconciliation, and there are many and they are all good, is that reconciliation is all about a passive unity, a passive peace. Let's just forgive. Let's just move on. Why can't we all just come together and have a unity night and share some soul food and mingle and just pretend like everything's OK and just go on about our business? Oftentimes, our theology of reconciliation is really just a theology of resurrection. Let's just get to the part where we're all having breakfast on Sunday morning, brunch. Let's just brunch. Let's enjoy it. Let's enjoy being together. Miguel de la Torre, who's an ethicist and theologian you may be familiar with, has written a great book that just came out last week called Embracing Hopelessness. And I read it in one day because I, was, I just love his, his thinking and his writing, and it really challenges me. And he said, you know, this whole idea of focusing on the resurrection, of focusing on hope, of being obsessed with hope is really an artifact of privilege because the vast majority of this world lives in a perpetual Holy Saturday where they're just licking the wounds of Friday night, and there's no real evidence that Sunday's ever coming. And this obsession with, well, what about me? Make sure I'm feeling hopeful and encouraged and make sure that this, the outlook looks sunny and that, yes, maybe it'll cost me something, but the benefits will outweigh the cost, right? Prove that to me. If we do that, though, we miss the whole point of the resurrection because in order to have resurrection, we first must die. And it's where we find ourselves at this place of the cross, of this place of, well, what exactly do I need to give up so that we might be whole? What do I need to give up so that I can experience resurrection? What might I need to give up so I can be whole? Yesterday, I talked a bit about how 
we really we experience a fractured humanity when we're not engaging in this perichoresis relationship. We aren't truly living, because if we're designed to be mutually indwelling with people who are distinct from us, then we aren't even self-actualized. We're being robbed of our humanity. And so I want us to very quickly this morning, before we get into a hermeneutic that I've developed to help me think about this in a practical, practical theological way, I want us to take one quick glance at Philippians 2. Because yesterday we talked a bit about unity and this that Paul calls us to in Philippians 2, and then we're going to talk about what, what that's going to cost, what that looks like. And so I'm going to read it to you. I'm reading from the inclusive um, Bible translation, just Philippians 2. You can just listen, and as my Episcopal Buddhist friend says, just let it wash over you. Or you can read along if you'd like. But Philippians 2, I'm just going to read the first 13 verses. If our life in Christ means anything to you, if God's love or the Spirit that we have in common or any tenderness or sympathy can persuade you at all, then be united in your convictions and united in your love with a common purpose and a common mind. That is the one thing that would make me completely happy. There must be no competition among you, no conceit, but everybody is to be humble, value, value others over yourselves, each of you thinking of the interests of others before your own. I'm going to stop there and just comment. Paul's interesting because even though we hadn't, um, our Trinitarian theology or, or a Trinitarian theology hadn't really been fully developed and articulated um, in Paul's time, what's interesting is even in this the very beginning, he sets the stage for us. He's talking about the, the relationship of the Trinity. In the first verse, he says, if, if Christ means anything to you, if God's love or the spirit that you all have in common, right there, he names all three members of the Trinity. And so he's not just saying, hey, I'm calling, I, want, I want you all to have the kind of unity that we have if we join a Facebook group together or if we collaborate on um, a missions project together or if we're all in the vestry together. I'm actually calling you to a higher level of unity, this perichoresis relationship, this equality and reciprocity and mutuality and mutual indwelling. And so he's already setting the bar high. And then he says right away, if you get that love, if you get that love, then be united in your convictions. Share brain space. You don't all have to agree because the members of the Trinity don't see everything the same way. But share brain space. Are you mutually interior to each other? Do you know what it's like? Do you really know what it's like to be an undocumented immigrant in our country? Do you really know what it's like to be a black man haunted by society? Do you really know what it's like to be an aging American citizen who's left on the margins? Do you really know what it's like to be a woman in academia? Are we sharing brain space? Or are we just saying, eh, I read a blog post about it and I kind of get it. Or I can approximate what your experience is because you are all the same. But then what Paul does, and I'm convinced that Paul is a social psychologist, because what he does is he says, <laughs> he says next, beware. Verse 3, beware. Look out for this. There must be no competition among you, no conceit. Everybody's to be humble, valuing others over yourselves. Each of you thinking of the interests of others before your own. He knows that our self-esteem and our group memberships get caught up in being defensive. And we're going to want to feel good about ourselves, even if that means infrahumanizing other people, if it means derogating other people, if it means distancing ourselves from other people when it doesn't feel good to connect with them. Paul's warning us, this is a problem. Be on the lookout for this. But then, and this is the hardest part for me, and the part that every single time I read this, even though I've studied this passage somewhat extensively, he says in verse 5, if you want this kind of unity, if you want to participate in the perichoresis of the Trinity, your attitude must be the same as that of Christ Jesus. 
Christ, though, in the image of God, didn't deem equality with God something to be clung to, but instead became completely empty and took on the image of oppressed humankind, born into the human condition, found in the likeness of a human being. Jesus was thus humbled, obediently accepting death, even death on a cross. Because of this, God highly exalted Christ and gave to Jesus the name above every other name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee must bend in the heavens, on the earth, and under the earth, and every tongue proclaim to the glory of God, Jesus Christ reigns supreme. Therefore, my dear friends, you who are always obedient to my urging, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Not only when I happen to be with you, but all the more now that I'm absent. It is God at work in you that creates the desire to do God's will. I teach a class called Power, Inequality, and Reconciliation at Duke. And one of the passages that we look deeply at is this one. And it's, in, um, it's so inspiring and fun for me to talk about this with young students who very much have this heart. They want to do what Paul is saying. And they, they're at the very beginning of their ministry careers. And they want to just charge out there and participate in what Paul's talking about, this kenosis. He says, if you want to participate in this kind of unity, then follow the way Jesus did it. In the theological term is kenosis and emptying. Jesus emptied himself of his power and his privilege and his prestige and came to earth to be among us, to experience life with us. And most of my students say, yes, sign me up for that. I want to do it. And then I say, well, how are you going to do that? I'm just going to be humble. Okay, well, what do you mean? You know, I'm just going to go and administer. I'm going to be humble. Again, that sounds vague. Um, what do you mean? Because typically, when people who come from powerful places, like Duke or VTS, when we try to be humble, oppressed people usually end up getting hurt. Because our whole definition of humility doesn't translate well among the vast majority of this world's population. Our definition of humility can actually be oppressive. So then what do we mean exactly? And I, I can relate to my students, because when I first started reading this passage, I was thinking, yes, I want to be humble like Jesus did. I want to engage in kenosis. I want to empty myself too, but it's just a little bit complicated because Paul helps us to focus on the incarnation here. And typically when we talk about kenosis, we stop at the incarnation. And I don't know about you, but it's really hard for me to imagine how I can cross metaphysical planes like Jesus did so that I can empty myself. It's, it's a beautiful idea. It's inspiring. But I don't know how that maps onto my experience as a human being in human flesh, bound to this world. And so what I decided to do is to look to see, well, if Jesus engages in kenosis in the incarnation, is it possible that Jesus continues to engage in kenosis as a human being on earth among other human beings? And what would it look like for me to examine that in our record of Jesus' life? on earth. And so I worked with one of my colleagues to develop what I'm calling a canonic hermeneutic, where we're, we looked through all the Gospels through the lens of how is Jesus aware of his social location, aware of the power and privilege and status that he has relative to other people, and how is he emptying himself in his everyday interactions. Because as a human being, I can look to see what Jesus as a human being does and model my own kenosis after that, or at least my attempts at kenosis. And one of the things that's interesting is it seems clear as we've worked through all the Gospels, and I'll give you one example um, to show you how I'm using this hermeneutic, but what's clear to me is that Jesus had a sociological imagination. If we look for it, we see Jesus totally aware of what's going on in the social situation completely aware of what sort of power he and others possess in that space, 
and very strategically and deliberately emptying himself. It is not a vague humility. It is a strategic humility that Jesus seems to demonstrate. I've done a lot of youth ministry in my life, probably about 12 or 15 years or so. And one of the, one of the stories that I often share with junior high and high school kids that I'm working with is the story about Jesus and Jairus and the woman who'd been bleeding for 12 years. And so it was with great delight to turn my hermeneutic lens towards this story, one that has enriched me so much, to see what is Jesus doing. So this shows up in all three of the synoptic gospels. And the story more or less, there's some minor details that vary, but the story more or less goes like this. Jesus had been ministering for a few months at this point. This is somewhat early in his ministry career. But he'd, he'd had some, some miracles under his belt at this point. But they were all among people who were kind of on the margins of society. He'd healed some lepers. He'd healed some blind people. He'd fed some people who didn't have enough money to even bring their own lunch, right? And so he's, he's, he's doing miracles, but it's not amongst the powerful. It's not amongst the people who have stature in society. And again, it's another day. Jesus is healing people. And the, the, he's surrounded by a crowd of probably thousands. And Jairus comes to him. Now, Jairus is an important person. Jairus has privilege in society. J Jairus has power. And this is the first documented instance of someone really important coming to Jesus and saying, my child is sick. I need your help. So this is an opportunity for Jesus to expand his Twitter platform to do something noteworthy. And Jesus loves the gyruses too. He's not a respecter of persons. And so of course his heart wants to heal Jairus' child. And as they're walking towards Jairus' home, as the crowds are surrounding him, this woman who'd been bleeding for 12 years touches him. And all three of the Gospels say she was immediately healed. Jesus knew that she had been healed. The power had gone out of him. He recognized it. She was healed. It was done. But then Jesus does something really curious. He says, who touched me? And as a social psychologist and someone who's looking to understand how is Jesus aware of his social location, what is Jesus trying to do? How is Jesus engaging in kenosis? I have to ask the question, why would Jesus say, who touched me? The miracle was done. He was on his way to heal Jairus' child. And even his disciples were like, that's a stupid question. Everybody's touching you. Okay. <laughs> this makes no sense. It makes no sense to ask, who touched me? But if you think about it, if you apply your sociological imagination, you can see up until this point, all eyes are on Jesus as someone who had stature in his society. Jesus was a teacher, so he had privilege there. Jesus, had, Jesus was male in a society that often did not value women. Jesus was, yes, a Jew under Roman occupation, but that's certainly better than a Samaritan. So he had power there. Jesus was free in a slave society. So he had privilege there. And so up until this point, all eyes are on Jesus and all eyes are on Jairus, the people that usually are focused on in society because Jairus was a leader in the community and wealthy and had servants and was important. And by asking the question, who touched me? Jesus shifts all of the attention away from himself and Jairus, and it turns towards this woman. My alarm keeps going off, I'm so sorry. Turns towards this woman, and I like the way Mark tells it, he says, and she got to tell her whole truth. <laughs> she got to preach. And this is a woman who probably smelled really horribly, probably looked really horribly, probably was homeless because her family would have, it would have been within their rights to cast her out, probably was never able to tell her story publicly, and I bet her whole truth was not a short truth. 
I bet she was talking and talking and sharing and sharing 12 years of being sick and marginalized and cast out and oppressed and the experience of Jesus healing her. And I bet her truth was not a linear truth. I bet she was being circular. I bet she was being repetitive. I bet it was jumbled. I bet the privileged, educated people were like, um, this does not really make sense to me. How can this be valuable? It's not being said. I mean, where are the three points that you're supposed to be making? <laughs> Why should I even have to listen to this jumbled mess? Could there possibly be truth for me in her story? in her whole truth. She got to tell her whole truth. Jesus asked one question, and she got to tell her whole truth. Jesus emptied himself of his platform, his power, his privilege, and this woman got to tell her whole truth. Now, what's curious to me is what's going on with Jairus during this entire time, because Jairus has needs too. Jairus has sadness too. Jairus has pain too. Even those of us who identify as privileged in this society deal with hardship. Being privileged doesn't mean that life is easy and rosy all the time. And what's fascinating to me is there's no record of Jairus intervening. This woman is there telling her whole truth. She's for the first time the center of what God is doing in that community, the first time the center of the, what's newsworthy and noteworthy in that community. Her identity is being healed. She's able to be included in what's going on. She's valued. Her truth is being heard. And Jairus is just standing there with his pain and his anxiety, and his fear. And he could have easily stepped in and said, okay, Jesus, good, I'm glad you took time to do that. Now let's keep it moving. Because I have needs too. I have pain too. That would have been within his rights. In fact, privileged people do that all the time. Yeah, sure, 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 we'll address the needs of the marginalized for a second, but don't let it inconvenience me or bore me or don't make me sit with the discomfort of my own pain not being addressed because someone else's pain is being addressed. Where did all the white people go? I mean, what's happening with Jairus is what I think is every privileged person's greatest fear. If Jesus is making things right and I get to participate in that, What's going to happen to me? If I advocate that more women become bishops, will I get to be bishop? If I advocate for affirmative action policies in the workplace, will my child get a job? One of my students, one of my masters of theological studies students and I are working on a big research project where we're actually interviewing uh, pastoral leaders of all denominations, trying to understand exactly how they practice their privilege in their spaces. And this keeps coming up over and over and over again, but what about me? The question of Jairus. Do my needs have to be put on hold so that other needs can be taken care of? And so much of this comes out of a theology of scarcity. As much as we talk about the resurrection, we certainly don't actually believe in it. The very idea that the table of God isn't abundant, that there isn't room for everyone, that we won't be taken care of if we, if we participate in the work of the cross, that comes from a space of fear and a space of scarcity, and it certainly doesn't come from the abundance of our very rich theology of the resurrection. But it's human, right? This is something that we, we naturally have to wrestle with. And most privileged people haven't really had to sit with the discomfort of that, like Jairus did. 
So even though Jairus probably could have easily intervened, could have said, wrap it up, lady. We, got, we have more things to do. Jesus is busy. He didn't. Jesus and Jairus sat there, and they heard this woman preach. And then what's fascinating to me is, as Jairus is sitting there listening, as Jesus is making things right in an unequitable community, Jesus is making things right, creating space for this woman. Jairus is put on hold. That's the reality. Jairus is put on hold. Jesus is saying, the first will be last, and the last will be first, and this is what it looks like. Jairus had to sit there with his pain and his anxiety and listen to this woman. And then Jairus' worst fears come to fruition. His servants come and they say, it's too late. While Jesus was taking care of this person who should have just been marginalized in society, your child died. This is, again, every privileged person's worst fear, according to my research. Where did all the white people go? What's going to happen to us? But then Jesus says to him, but just believe. Jairus, just believe. This isn't in the text, and I can't prove it. I'll name that. That's okay. But my understanding of perichoresis, this mutual indwelling, the ways in which we self-actualize in relationship with each other, we truly become human when we're receiving the good gifts that God has for us through other people. This lens leads me to interpret this scripture in this way. Jairus was able to believe because he had just heard this woman tell her truth. If he hadn't been preached to by her, I don't believe he would have been able to believe. After coming to Jesus as a privileged person in society and saying, I need your help, and then to see Jesus help someone else, and then hear this horrible news, and then still believe. It's only because he had just heard this woman's miraculous story of God working in her life and had been nourished by that and the ways in which we're supposed to be nourished by the experiences and theologies and perspectives of people who are different than us. And he was able to believe, and they went home, and Jesus healed his child, resurrected her, actually, I like to think of it as a double miracle, extra miracle at this point. What's interesting about this is we don't often apply a sociological lens to our interpretation of scripture. More often than not, when I read this passage with people and we study it, people identify with the woman who'd been bleeding for 12 years. Almost no one identifies with Jairus and says, yes, that's me. I'm the person who usually has the platform in society. I'm the person who usually is the important one in society. I have a voice. And this possibility of me being put on hold, my needs being put on hold, so I can participate in the making of all things new, that doesn't occur to us. But if we want to participate in the kenosis that Jesus demonstrates for us, if we want to empty ourselves the way that Jesus did, we actually have to take inventory of what exactly it is that we need to empty ourselves of. What are the ways in which we are like Jairus? How do we hold power and how do we have a voice? How do we have influence? How do we have upward mobility in our society? It's one thing to preach about reconciliation. It's one thing to preach about equality. It's another thing to say, well, what exactly do I benefit from in our society that perpetuates this inequality? And what would it look like for me to empty myself 
the way that Jairus did, the way that Jesus invited Jairus into. And this is not an easy task because so often we don't want to take a hard look at our lives. It's easy for us to identify with the ways in which we maybe feel marginalized in society. And I'm not saying those experiences aren't real. But those of us in this room are privileged in so many ways. Every single one of us. And this journey has been really interesting for me to go on as a black woman in our society because I obviously can identify with some oppressed groups. I'm, I'm like Jesus. I'm a little bit complicated in my intersectional identity. In some ways, Jesus was oppressed. In some ways, Jesus was privileged. And we have to navigate that complexity. But oftentimes, you know, I talk with some of my students as we're, you know, as we're having these discussions about, and particularly my power and inequality and reconciliation class, what does it look like to empty ourselves and take inventory? I often say, you know, I, I have a lot of power and influence in our society. I'm invited to go speak all over the place. People give me book contracts. People ask me to write for national magazines. People ask me to speak into denominational leadership and organizational leadership issues. Sometimes mayors and senators call asking for advice on how to handle a crisis. And I get to influence people. Meanwhile, in my neighborhood of mostly, of predominantly black, low-income folks who are not formally educated like I am, their observations about faith, about politics, about current events are way more astute than my own, yet no one's giving them book contracts or asking them to come speak at their church or interviewing them for a Washington Post article. And I see that I'm gyrus. And what's interesting is oftentimes my students will react against that in defense of me. And they'll be like, no, Dr. Cleveland, but you deserve more of a voice. You deserve more of a platform. You deserve more influence. I mean, you worked hard for all those degrees. You worked hard to do all that writing. And then I'm like, yeah, I did work hard. It's true. I was there for all the all-nighters. I did it. It's true. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that I'm not incredibly privileged. I grew up in a home where both parents went to college. And that are automatically makes me more than three times as likely to go to college as anyone else in this country. And my parents are unique because they really only care about two things, Jesus and education. And they're very consistent. And so my dad and his brother went to Princeton and Yale. My dad went to Yale, his brother went to Princeton. And they, but they had gone, been educated in Compton, California, in public schools, which is the hood. And so um, when they were at, at these Ivy League colleges, they realized you know, some of our classmates who had received a better education prior to coming here are thriving in ways that we're not. So they decided to raise their kids um, to be prepared to succeed at Ivy League schools. And they were very intentional and disciplined about this. And so we actually started studying for the SATs when I was in first grade because my dad wanted us to be prepared. And I didn't know that we were studying for the SATs at the time. Um, we were just doing reading comprehension questions and analogies for an hour and a half every day. After we got home from school, we would have our regular homework, and then we'd have to do an hour and a half of these reading comprehension questions and workbooks. And I didn't know I was studying for the SATs at the time, but then when I did take the SATs, it was all like very familiar. And so I was like, oh, I've been studying for this for like about 12 years. Um, but another thing my parents did is they kind of curated our lives around preparing us for college and for beyond. And so um, one of the things they did is they lied to us, and they told us that the only thing open in the summer is the library. And so, 
every single day, we spent all day at the library. My mom, we would have breakfast, my mom would pack lunches, we'd spend the whole day at the library doing enrichment activities, and we were gullible, we just believed it. We're like, well, school's closed, so therefore, I guess everything's closed, you know? And so we just went to the library, it wasn't until I was in fifth grade that I discovered that there's an amusement park near our house. That's where everybody else went in the summer. Um, and another thing they did is they wanted us to be cultured, so we had season tickets to the opera, San Francisco Opera, Ballet, and Symphony, and a couple times a month we'd get all dressed up as a family and go to um, an event. And my first concert when I was five years old was Leontine Price, the famous black opera singer. Um, so I've been exposed to a lot of the fine arts, and also, when I was in third grade, my dad signed us up for Saturday Science Academy at UC Berkeley. And so we would take the BART into Berkeley every Saturday morning at 8 a.m. and we would spend all day until about 5 p.m. in the science labs. And we were surrounded by other kids of color. It was a special program for kids of color in the Bay Area. And all of our teachers were UC Berkeley undergrads of color. So here I am in these huge university chemistry labs being taught by people who look like me, surrounded by people who look like me. I'm learning to navigate a, a, a significant research university campus all by myself as a third grader. And I'm like, how hard can college be? I'm practically doing it, you know? <laughs> like, you just get used to it. Um, and at home, it was kind of like college all the time, too, because my dad had Yale everything. We had Yale toothbrushes, towels, blankets, <laughs> pajamas, you name it, it said Yale on it. And every night at dinner, my dad would have us recite the eight Ivy League schools to him <laughs> so that he knew that we knew where we were going. <laughs> Carefully curated life. All of my parents' resources as middle class clergy went in the direction of getting us tutors, of getting us extra help when we needed it, of buying us books, when I, was in, when I was 15, my dad, who had a roommate at Yale who went to Phillips Exeter, said, you should go to Phillips Exeter, Christina. And so I applied and I got in. And because my dad had the skills and the knowledge, I was able to apply for financial aid and get a full scholarship and participate in this world that I had access to simply because of my parents and the knowledge that they had. And if you look at the six Cleveland cousins who were all raised under this loving regime, <laughs> between us, we have degrees from Yale, Harvard, MIT, Princeton, Dartmouth, and Oberlin. And so it works if you give people resources, if you give people access, if you give people knowledge, if you, if you raise them in safe middle-class communities where they don't have to worry about, am I gonna get shot on my way home from school? Is there gonna be food on my table tonight? Um, do I have a bed to sleep in? Do I have teachers who are supportive? And even if they aren't supportive, can my parents buy me a physics tutor to help me? Do I have parents who can navigate the world, the confusing and intimidating world of a financial aid and FAFSAs? Do I have parents that are working normal hours and can actually be home to offer emotional support and in some cases, academic support? And then what happens when I join the ranks of the elite? the 30% of adults in the United States who have some college education, what happens then? How does it just snowball? And then I get opportunities to go to grad school, and I get opportunities to join faculties, and I get opportunities to write books. And that doesn't mean that I didn't work hard, and it doesn't mean that those of us who do this work to take inventory didn't work hard. It doesn't mean that everything was handed to you on a silver spoon. Privilege is not like Downton Abbey. That's an outdated understanding of privilege. Privilege is having the wind behind your back. So when you're walking, everything in society is supporting your movement. But if the wind's behind your back and you're going for a walk, it just feels like a good day. You don't necessarily notice that the wind is behind your back. 
But if the wind is against you, you certainly notice. And in every way that I was supported, and not only just by my family, but the broader society, because I was a member of a family who was part of the educational elite, and all of society supports those of us who are formally educated. I went to decent public schools. I had teachers who were well-trained. I had basketball coaches who cared about my academics. It wasn't just my nuclear family. It was all of society that was supporting me. So every single step of the way, I had support, which meant that for me, if I worked hard, I would succeed, more or less. If I put effort in, I would experience success. Living in my neighborhood, though, amongst folks who are low income, predominantly black, the average, I think the average, I think only less than 30% of the households have a, a private vehicle. So the vast majority of the homes use public transportation. That's a significant indicator of family wealth in the United States. In every single way that I was supported, my neighbors are not. And so if by some like sheer act of super heroic invincibility that we really only require marginalized people to have, if somehow a kid in my neighborhood successfully graduates from the high school four blocks from my house, the high school that I pay taxes to support, and only about 27% of them do successfully graduate because of all of the impediments around them. If they do somehow graduate, one of the things I learned in a practice that I did for several years called Breakfast Club, where I invited a bunch of high school girls over to my house for breakfast, and we would talk about God and life and eat waffles, and then it became lunch club and dinner club because people would stay and do their homework and laundry and all of these other things. One thing I learned is we started turning towards college. They, they met me and thought, wow, you're black, I'm black. You don't even, you didn't just go to college, you actually teach at a college. Wow, all of a sudden my imagination is expanding. So we started thinking about, what would it look like for you to go to college? We started mapping out their curriculum and my heart broke the day that I realized, as I was surrounded by about 15 of these girls, that if they somehow, against all odds, graduated from high school, they still would not have the curricular, um, they would still not have the curricular preparation to apply to a four-year college, because their school does not offer a college prep curriculum. It is impossible to graduate from that high school and actually have the courses that you need in order to apply to four-year college. They don't have any extracurriculars. They don't have any modern languages. They don't have any arts. They only get three years of English classes, and you need four to apply to college. It's a public school. So the wind is blowing against their back. Oh, sorry, against them and the wind is blowing in favor of people like me, and it's only through taking inventory and recognizing there's some things that I benefit from in our society that these precious girls don't have access to. One of the things that is so difficult, I think, for us as we think practically around privilege is that our first instinct when we might begin to take inventory, of course, is to feel some guilt and shame which we need to work through. That's part of the journey for privileged people, something to be embraced, something to be attentive to, something to be mindful of. But our next step is usually, oh, wow, Let's do something to make everything equal. Let's fight for equality. And for so many folks like myself, I have this vision of a round table where we're all together and everyone has an equal voice. 
and that we all share power. Again, it's vague how we do it, but the idea is that we share power and everyone has an equal place at the table. But in using my hermeneutic and trying to understand how Jesus emptied himself over and over again in this canonic way, I've come to realize that Jesus isn't at all interested in equality. Jesus never talks about equality, actually. Jesus is not interested in everybody being treated the same. Jesus is not interested in everybody having an equal voice. That's something that we've inherited with our Western American ideals. We have this idolatry of equality. Jesus is interested in equity. Jesus is not interested in everyone treating each other the same. Jesus is interested in everyone getting what they need in order to make things right. And that's why Jesus was able to put Jairus on hold so that he could stop everything and say, who touched me and allow this woman to have a chance to preach. And this is the part that makes people really angry and uncomfortable. I know I can speak from my own personal experience that when I, even though I've benefited from inequality my whole life, I'm obsessed with getting a fair shake in the context of reconciliation. If you get to share your story, then I get to share my story. If you get to accuse me, then I get to defend myself. If you, it's tit for tat which is interesting because all up to now it hasn't been tit for tat, <laughs> but now all of a sudden I'm obsessed with this. And we see this in scripture too in Matthew 20 when Paul, I mean, sorry, not Paul, Jesus is talking about this is what the kingdom of God is going to look like. It looks like a landowner who goes at the beginning of the day and hires people and says, I'm going to pay you a day's wage and then comes back mid-morning and finds more people who are still looking and says, um, come, I have room for you, and then comes back midday and still finds more people who are unemployed, looking for work, and he says, I have room for you, and then comes at the end of the day, an hour before the end of the day, and says, you're still here looking for work? There's a place for you on my farm. Come, work with me. And then, when it's time to pay everybody, he pays everybody a day's wage. And who's upset? It's the people who got picked first who are upset. And they're so angry and they're so uncomfortable. And as I've looked at this with my hermeneutic, I think, well, who gets picked first? It's the people who speak the language. It's the people who have documentation. It's the people who are able-bodied. It's the people who just fit with the culture. It's the people who are male, the people who are white. And who would be left at the end of the day? Who are the people that Jesus is talking to when he's saying, there's room for you, too? The folks who are perhaps not able-bodied, they're, diff they're differently abled. Perhaps they're queer. Perhaps they're transgendered. Perhaps they're brown. Perhaps they don't speak the language. And Jesus is saying, there's room for you too. I have a place for you too. And then when he pays everyone equally, it's the folks at the beginning who thought they deserved more. They wanted equality, but they got equity. And that made them so mad. And then Jesus makes this astounding theological statement. He says, in the kingdom of God, the first will be last, and the last will be first. And if we're going to move forward, this is what it's going to look like. I often get emails from people who hear me talking about privilege and power, and they say, you know, I'm, 
I'm white and male and cisgendered and straight and middle class and formally educated and I'm clergy and I'm good looking and I'm all the things that makes me privileged. I'm the pinnacle of privilege here. And I feel like whenever we have these conversations, I don't know where my place is. I don't know how I'm supposed to participate in this work. It just seems like it'd be better if I were just gone, if I didn't exist. And my response is always, no, you absolutely have a role. You have a wonderful, crucial, important role, and that role is last. And you are needed to be last. Because Jesus is making things right. The story only works if Jairus is willing to inhabit his role of being put on hold and participating and leading in what God is doing by saying, yes, I too am going to submit to this. It only works if we actually take our rightful place. The table of reconciliation is not a round one. It's an oval one. There is a head and there is a foot of the table. But this is so hard for us to do, particularly because the moral high ground tends to be the final frontier of power and privilege. It's kind of like, you know, we'll allow you to provide some color to our liturgies, maybe share your cultural customs, maybe we'll do some translation into another language, um, but don't ask us to reevaluate the way that we're interpreting this scripture. Don't tell us that what we've already declared is sacred or profane. Don't tell us that maybe we need to reconsider that. Don't challenge the final frontier of power, which is the moral high ground. At the end of the day, we know best what God is saying, who God is, and how to practice Christianity. I was working with a, a seminary faculty on addressing this in their midst, this vast inequality. And it's probably, I don't, I don't know VTS very well, but I imagine it's not different here. I think this, this trend is in a lot of different seminaries where the faculty have the most power, especially the theologians. Um, and then next, you know, biblical scholars, but especially the ones who study the Pentateuch, right? Not those wisdom literature people, right? Um, and then beneath that, there's... Um, the historians, and then there's the practical theologians and ministerial people, right? So then there's that, but then beneath all of them are the staff, right? And then beneath all of them are the students. I'm seeing some nods, so maybe I'm, on, I'm not off base here. Um, so I was working with the seminary faculty trying to help them see the ways in which they hold on to power. Because up until when we started intentionally looking at um, this question of how power is distributed in this, in this community, um, they were the only ones who were part of the discussion. So if there was a strategic planning process, it was only the faculty who were involved. If there was a crisis, it was only the faculty that were involved in trying to address this crisis. And so we did um, a massive listening process all over the seminary and gave everyone an opportunity to participate in this shared knowledge about who we are and what's going well and also what's not going well. And so there were times of affirmation and really blessing what God had been doing. Um, and then also some times of lament um, to address some of the concerns that came up. And what was so interesting is as soon as we got to the time for critique, after, after ample time of affirmation, um, as soon as we got to the time of critique, where these faculty were given an opportunity to listen to what the students and the staff were saying, particularly students of color and queer students and students outside of this denominational um, tribe, students who might experience marginalization in these spaces, all of a sudden it was, I don't even know what school they're describing. That doesn't even sound like this school. This wasn't my experience when I was a student here in 1965. <laughs> so I don't know how this, if this wasn't my reality, it's not a reality. If this isn't my truth, it's not a truth. They just sound bitter. 
Why do we even, why, why would we even listen to people? I mean, they, if they have constructive feedback, they need to say it in a much more hopeful way because they're just making me feel shamed. But these are the subtle ways that we hold on to power. Tone policing is what it's called in the literature. I'll only receive it if you say it to me in a specific way. What this faculty had not yet learned is that Jesus isn't interested in equality. In a process like this where the people who've held power are trying to hear from other people, no, everyone doesn't have an equal voice. The people who have been marginalized, their voices should be privileged in our common in our common exploration of what is true. Miguel de la Torre also talks a lot about the toxicity of power and how when we've benefited from power, when we've benefited from privilege, even if we're not the evil empire, and even if we're not the evil emperor atop the empire, if we've just benefited from it, we've become poisoned by that power. And therefore, we no longer have access to pure ethics. We no longer can say, I am seeing things clearly. And we actually need to rely on those who have been marginalized, who have not been poisoned by power to show us the way. This particular faculty especially needed to listen to the students who had been on the margins, especially those that had felt the the brunt of being marginalized and were bitter. Because the first will be last and the last will be first. And the only way forward is by listening well to the very people that we think deserve to be on the margins. Listening well to the very people that we think haven't earned a right to have a voice, perhaps because they haven't been here long enough. The very people who, like the woman who'd been bleeding for 12 years, was never listened to. Didn't have an eloquent speech. Didn't present herself in ways that society would accept. Didn't fit in. You must listen well. I'm gonna stop by inviting us to listen well. I'm gonna end by inviting us to listen well. I wanna to read to you all a womanist apostles creed. And this might, if this is challenging, just lean into the challenge, because I know you all <laughs> have a, um, I know you all have a commitment to the apostles creed. Um, so this is an invitation to listen to a marginalized woman's perspective. Keep in mind that the average person in the world today is a woman of color who lives in the global south, lives in poverty, and is, at, is daily at risk of violence. That's the average person in the world today. So when we listen in, we're getting a glimpse into who God is from this perspective, what it means to be human. I believe in God, our mother bear, source of all being. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's wisdom made flesh, along with Sophia, the church, and all that live in wisdom. Born of the badass womanist liberation theologian Mary, <laughs> suffered, <laughs> suffered under the systems of oppression of this world, was crucified, died and was buried, forever joining in solidarity with those murdered by empire. On the third day, the women declared him risen, signifying God's no to oppression. Jesus points to God, our mother bear, who works in this world, calling for justice for the poor and oppressed. I believe in Sophia's spirit, Christ's body, the church, the communion of saints, the grace to reject this world's systems, hope for justice in the future, and renewed life everlasting. Amen. Amen. 
I'm happy to um, open it up for questions at this point, if, you, if anyone has any. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Cleveland, uh, with your opening prayer, you prayed that we are troublemakers. <laughs> and in the rest of your lecture today, you pointed out um, the price that this might take for us here with the privilege to be last. So I really appreciate it. And thank you for your enthusiasm. And I know you have a couple of questions. We have about 10 minutes for them. Now, don't make me have to call on the dean for a question. because he... <laughs> uh, I see one right there. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cleveland, um, thank you. I was having a conversation, I live in St. Louis, so we're having, in some ways, the outward and visible conversation on race uh, for the country right now in St. Louis. And I was meeting with a prisoner of mine who does diversity work, and because today is National Coming Out Day, um, we're both gay men, and we were talking about how for both of us, a very kind of new entry into this work happened around coming out. Um, a different sort of, when you're able to embrace an identity, uh, a different kind of work happens. I was encouraged by your um, commentary for, you know, cis, white, privileged men, uh, what my friend refers to as sort of the idol of human identity uh, that we put up there. But I work with a lot of cis, white, privileged uh, people, and I wonder if you could say a bit more about how that uh, identity work can be done in a constructive manner for those folks? <laughs> sure. Um, I actually, so I, I find that group to be one of the most difficult. Um, I think the only thing I would add to that is that that group in the baby boomer generation is probably the most difficult that I've worked with in terms of un, um, recognizing privilege and, and naming it and um, owning it. What would my recommendation be? Well, I think the challenge, I think in this case, um, because that identity is not named in the way that you had to name it when you came out, I think helping people name that. And one way that I've found to be particularly effective is talking about the way that the concept of race was even born in our society, and actually it was born right here in Virginia, if you didn't know, um, but it's a modern concept. And so talking about the way that whiteness is, um, is a system and it's not necessarily about an individual, that sort of takes some of the, um, it's disarming, I think, because then it can start as a philosophical conversation that eventually will hit home for them. Um, but talking about the way that whiteness was invented in order to um, uh, come up with a theological reason for enslaving black people here in, in, in an age of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yeah. Sure. Uh, what about the side of trying to use the privilege we have to help others? Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. What about the side of using, trying to use the privilege we have? I mean, you know, I'm a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant male, you know, uh, but I was taught by my family and some of that kind of coaching that you got in a different direction to use that for people, uh, to stand up for things that need to be stood up for. I think that's an important role. I, I think that often um, the way we do it needs to be um, open to critique from marginalized folks, because oftentimes when we're trying to help, we're actually um, contributing more to inequality. However, I think that you know, if one one of the roles that um, people who have privilege can pay can can take on is taking some of the hits among their own people. And so oftentimes what you see is like a privileged person saying like, oh, now that I know I'm privileged, I'm gonna go across power lines and essentially invade someone else's space. Um, when really the important work that needs to be done is amongst our own people 
and having those battles and fighting those fights and taking the hits and being excluded um, and practicing reconciliation in spaces where someone like me would never be invited. So thank you for encouraging us to do that. Very, thank you very much for, for such a wonderful conversation or, or talk. Um, my question is in regards to something I heard recently um, about the um, a sexual abuse from the uh, Harvey Weinstein in Hollywood. And I was listening to NPR and the question was, why are people so complicit and why has it taken so long? Mm. And so my question is really around complicity and how do we address that? Yeah. Yeah, I think, thank, thank you for asking that question um, because um, our commitment to holding on to power, right? Again, this, the idea of first being last and last being first sickens us, to be honest. We, many of us, if we're honest, have the same question of what happens to me if I do the right thing? Um, and I, think, I don't think our theology is robust enough to accommodate those daring um, stances. I also think um, it, here in the West, the church has been so um, in bed with power and empire. We don't even, uh, I think it's hard for, most Christians have been thus discipled into maintaining power for themselves. And so we don't even see that as being faithful, as standing up to power. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, we're here in the Episcopal church, which Certainly what's going on with Harvey Weinstein is, I was talking about it this morning with a friend just thinking, gosh, this is disgusting how many people didn't do anything or say anything. But um, I heard that um, W.B. Du Bois critiqued the Episcopal Church for the same thing and said that there's no one's been more of an enemy of the Negro than the Episcopal Church because of, again, that complicity, right? Like not not standing up for what's right when we have an opportunity to. So it's something for us to do some real soul searching around, that's for sure. You were talking about uh, marginalized people having a voice. I wonder how you react to this. There was an article recently about a teacher in an inner city school with her seventh graders and she poised this question to them, what would you like your teacher to know about you? And these were seventh grade inner city kids. And one student said, I'd like my teacher to know that I don't have a decent pair of shoes. And another student said, I would like my teacher to know that there are three of us children, we all share the same bed. And this gave the teacher insight to people who wouldn't ordinarily have a voice. And do you think this is a good model? Mm, asking people to share what they wish we knew. Is that the question? I think it can be a good model, absolutely. I think um, those are extraordinarily self-aware seventh graders um, who were able to name that. Um, um, I think the only caution I would have for that that approach is it puts a lot of the responsibility on oppressed people for educating the privileged people. Um, and I've decided myself that there is, a such, there is such a thing as a stupid question. Like there's a, there's a question that suggests that I've never, I have done no work on my own to try to understand you. Um, I think it's, we can pick up a book or watch a Netflix documentary or do something to start advancing our own education even if we do wanna invite other people to be partners with us, with, with us in that. Um, and I think also the caution is kind of going back to the, the text that we looked at with the woman who was bleeding for 12 years. More often than not, people are not going to be able to give us um, such a self-actualized response that we can actually understand because when you've been silenced and marginalized for a really long time, just speaking your truth on command um, is not a reasonable expectation. Yeah. Okay, we have time for maybe one more question. Yes, at the back. What do you say to people who 
acknowledge that they have privilege and power and just say, I want to hold on to it. Mm. They're just honest about yeah. it. Yeah, I say thank you for being honest because most people would never be that honest about it. If they're people of faith, then I can certainly invite them into a conversation on how their pathway to salvation and resurrection is through being last. And they're, in, they're living impoverished spiritual lives. Um, but sometimes those conversations are effective depending on where that person's heart is. And I know language nowadays in the sort of post post-missiological space that we're in theologically, a lot of language around conversion um, is outdated. But um, I do think that sometimes on this journey, it, it's helpful to think about this work as a second conversion for people, similar to Peter's second conversion in Acts. And so at that point, I turn really deeply to prayer, and I pray for God to work in that person, because you can be eloquent, you can have all the points, you can plead with them, and they might not say yes until, they, until this Holy Spirit intervenes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, before you all make your way over to St. Cyprian's Labyrinth, please join me in saying our thanks again to our Sprig lecturer.